So yeah, uh, I guess we can get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Kumju Lee Armstrong from the New England Crepes Campaign. Thank you for joining us tonight, this critical webinar addressing the concerns about the release of nuclear wastewater from Japan. Um, this webinar is organized by the Massachusetts Peace Action and by the New England Korea Peace Campaign, a grassroots organization working to formally end the Korean War, bring peace and reconciliation to the Korean Peninsula. Um, this webinar is also accessible through Facebook. Is it correct? Uh, yes, it's on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Okay, great. And later, we will share the recorded video with you. Since August 24th, Japan has been dumping radioactive cooling water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the sea. They plan to continue to dump over 3 million tons of nuclear waste water over the next 30 years. This is raising serious global health and safety concerns. So this webinar will talk about the release of radioactive water from Japan and its implications for the global community and our regions on the East Coast of the United States. The issue of nuclear waste water is also happening right where we live in Massachusetts. There's nuclear contaminated water at the, at the retired Plymouth nuclear power station and Holtec is at the center of the debate about releasing it into Cape Cod Bay. Today, we are going to have two experts talking about the nuclear waste water issue. Dr. Robert Richmond will discuss the global impact and how it might affect us from scientific perspectives. Ms. Diane Turco will address the local nuclear waste water issue providing a regional view with political angles. Let me introduce our two speakers. Dr. Richmond is a marine biologist and a research professor at the University of Hawaii Manoa. And he will bring over four decades of experience in this field to our webinar. Ms. Turco is a longstanding environmental activist who has been involved in advocating against the dumping of nuclear waste water into Cape Cod Bay as part of the decommissioning process of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. Our two experts will present for 20 minutes, totaling 40 minutes. After their presentations, we'll have a 12, uh, 20 minutes Q&A session. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them down in the chat. We'll address the, the questions in the Q&A session later. Without further ado, let's welcome the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Richmond and Ms. Tolko for joining us tonight. We look forward to gaining insights into the nuclear wastewater issues. Uh, first up, Dr. Richmond, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks. I guess it's the screen rather than the floor. So mm -hmm. Okay, yes, the screen, screen is yours, yeah. Uh, and let's see if this works. Go into mode. So can people see my presentation slide? Yes. Good? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks very much for the uh, introduction and the uh, opportunity. Um, just to give a little bit more background, um, I'm one of five members of a uh, expert advisory panel that was pulled together by a group called the Pacific Islands Forum. Um, it's 18 Pacific Island nations, 16 are indigenous island groups, and also Australia and New Zealand. And so for the past two years, I and my four colleagues have been deeply involved in studies of the Fukushima situation. Uh, we're scientists, so we were brought in um, to review the information. Uh, we uh, had the opportunity to go to Japan last February and had a chance to actually visit the Fukushima site. And over the last two years, then we've been meeting with members of the Japanese government, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, uh, members of the International Atomic Energy Agency, and again, came in with clean eyes as scientists to look at the data and then try to put it within the context of the concerns that have been raised. Uh, my own background is I actually worked in a department of radiation biology and biophysics, 
uh, way back when, when I was at the University of Rochester as an undergraduate, um, examining the ability of crayfish to pick up ruthenium-106 from nuclear power plants. I did my doctoral dissertation research at Enoetak Atoll, the home of the nuclear testing program for the United States. Um, someone mentioned uh, run it. I was there when they actually poured the run at dome and uh, was involved in studies of the uptake and accumulation and transfer of radionuclides through marine food webs. And uh, a lot of the work I do these days is in the area of ecotoxicology, primarily coral reefs. And so to put it in a context that we're not talking about painting on a blank canvas here. Um, the present state of our oceans is one of a compromised set of ecosystems in decline due to a variety of human induced disturbances. Uh, we know climate change, most people are aware of it, ocean acidification, elevated seawater temperatures and sea level rise. Uh, we're also in a world where uh, fisheries have been largely overexploited, both in the uh, Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, pollution is one of the areas in which I work. And so um, radionuclides, when they're uh, coming out of the nuclear power plant, are a type of pollutant. And we're adding that on a type of things like mercury, heavy metals, plastics, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, a variety of personal care products, and uh, nutrients from sewage and uh, runoff. And so there's a cumulative impact issue. So once again, when people just say, well, it's only radionuclides, it's not. It's a system that's already been overwhelmed with a variety of stressors, and we're adding one more. Also, it's very important to point out, especially within Pacific islands, that ocean health and human health are inextricably linked. Uh, for many of the islands in which I've worked, I've worked in the Pacific for 44 years now. Uh, the upper right-hand photo is uh, some of my fishing uh, colleagues from Inuitak Atoll. Uh, on the lower right-hand panel, are a group of women meeting on a uh, tidal flat uh, where these are not only for food security, but it's a very important part of their cultural identity and practices. Things that go on in the ocean within these coral reef ecosystems and coastal waters are extremely important, not only to their food and their economies, but also to individual and community health. Uh, one of the women's groups I work with in an island called Palau described the uh, coral reef as the community psychiatrist. This is where women get together, they work through a number of societal problems, uh, they're able to mentor the younger women and the children at the same time. And so these have a great role of economic stability, ecological integrity, and for these islands, they always look at things for the long term, intergenerational responsibility in the area of environmental sustainability. And I'm constantly asked if something goes forward, not only will it, what will it do to today's population, but especially to their children, their grandchildren, and generations to come. So the concerns regarding the uh, plants for the radioactive contaminated water that's already being discharged is the effects of the radionuclides on environmental and human health. This is truly what we call a transboundary issue because it's not gonna stay within Japan's territorial waters. But we know back in 2011, when the uh, disaster occurred, within that same year, tuna caught off of San Diego, California, were found with radioactive cesium-137 that was transported in the fish across. The levels were very low, so I wanna make sure to clarify that. Um, but remember that this discharge is to go on for over 30 years. Tuna can easily reach 26 years in age. So there's a real concern about uptake, bioaccumulation, and then transfer into people eating seafood. Um, we look at the interactions between the chemistry and the biology. Um, many of the statements made by the chemists and the physicists is that um, it's going to be negligible effect, um, but they're only looking at the chemistry. If you look at the volume of the Pacific Ocean, you calculate the concentration of radionuclides. If the world uh, in the Pacific Ocean were a sterile aquarium, they would be absolutely correct, but that's not the situation at all. We see biological interactions with ecological, cultural, and economic uh, implications. And most importantly, our group did a, a quick study to determine there are better options out there. So it's one thing to say no, but we did a calculation on if it could be used, uh, the contaminated water uh, for making concrete on site. And the answer is yes, it would probably use up the water in a period of five to seven years rather than 30 years. And it would make it non-transboundary. It would not be biologically uh, available and it would not be of any uh, consequence to populations away from it. Um, the International Atomic Energy Agency has been involved in quote-unquote review, but it's very important to point out that even though they're part of the United Nations, uh, the United Nations has three what they call rapporteurs for human rights, and all three rapporteurs have come out strongly against this as a violation of human rights in the Pacific. 
Um, and remember, IAEA, if you go to their website, they even indicate that they have a mandate to promote the peaceful use of uh, nuclear technologies. I give them high marks in terms of what they're trying to do and have tried to do uh, to stop uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, especially places like Iran, uh, now in Chernobyl, um, especially during the, uh, the problems going on there. Uh, but when it comes to their uh, role in this particular issue, uh, we have very big concerns about conflicts of interest. Uh, they have no regulatory authority whatsoever that resides with Japan's Nuclear Regulation Agency. And in their 2023 report uh, that's constantly cited as green lighting the release, it's very important to read exactly what was said. Um, they only said that if everything goes to plan, they will be operating within international standards. Some of these standards are years old or decades old. They're not uh, using the best technology. But it's interesting to look very carefully and listen to what uh, Director General Grossi said. They neither recommend that plan, nor do they endorse the release. They don't justify it, nor do they offer alternatives. They only say if everything goes perfectly, they will in fact uh, be within ex existing standards, which is no indication of safety from my perspective. Um, this is where we talk about some of the my most concerns I have as a marine biologist. This is where a lot of my work was focused. Uh, we have a nuclear physicist, nuclear chemist, an oceanographer, uh, one member who is very strong on regulatory authority. And my concern is this is where chemistry and biology collide. Um, the discharge is to occur over 30 years. And we know already that many of these radionuclides can be taken up by organisms. They can be what we call trophically transferred up the food web, and they can be bioaccumulated, which is the pathway for getting into people. Um, we've often heard, well, this is low level beta emitters. Um, there's different kinds of ionizing radiation, alpha, beta, gamma rays. Gamma is the high energy one, but what we're most concerned about is what's called RBE, relative biological effectiveness. Low level beta emitters are a big concern, especially when they're taken internally. Because of their low energy, they get embedded and stuck in tissue near cells where they can continue to radiate for a long period of time. One of the chemicals or one of the radionuclides that cannot be removed by their advanced liquid processing system is called tritium. It's tritiated water, it's a form of hydrogen, but it can become organically bound. And this is the issue, is it's not just tritium in the water or tritiated water that's the concern, it's how it gets into sediments, how it gets into marine organisms, and how it can be bound up into tissue, liver, and fat. And there's a version called non-escapable and non-soluble um, this can reside for over 550 days of biological effectiveness uh, within the livers of bottom fish. And so any statement to say that uh, tritium is negligible or not, not important is missing a very important element of how tritium works in the environment. Um, there is no threshold below which ionizing radiation does not operate, especially when we talk about stochastic effects on things like DNA. Um, the kinds of damage to the DNA that can be occurring is single-strand and double-strand damage. It can affect RNA um, signaling proteins that are telling cells what to do and uh, basically operating uh, the lives of all uh, organisms. And then there's also a difference between nuclear DNA that has a membrane around it versus mitochondrial DNA, which is kind of the scientific geek way of looking at what's in the cells and how they're affected. But the mitochondria are the energy power plants for the body and they are much more sensitive to uh, this kind of ionizing radiation. And of course, there's a big difference. Beta emitters generally won't uh, make it through skin or clothing, but if you take them internally, then there really is no protection for the cells and the DNA and the RNA, and that's what we're most concerned, not the external exposure to low-level beta emitters, but the internal one uh, when they're eaten. And this is kind of a, a picture of what goes on on the left side. We see a tritium atom and a carbon-14 atom. Tritium has a half-life of 12.3 years, carbon-14, 5,730 years. So you can see a big difference there, but this shows the amount of time when we talk about this being not only transboundary, it's transgenerational because some of these radionuclides have very, very long half-lives. Both carbon-14 and tritium can be taken up by phytoplankton. Uh, in the middle row of photos, at the very top, the beautiful green geometric figures are a microscopic view of phytoplankton. From there, they can get into zooplankton, microscopic animals that live in the water. They can also get into bottom sediments. And then through phytoplankton, zooplankton, and bottom sediments, 
they can get into bottom feeders, they can get into pelagic fish, and then at the top right-hand side, they can get into the people who eat these organisms. Um, the sea cucumber on the bottom is a highly prized uh, edible product, not only in the islands, but throughout Asia. And these can pick up large amounts of radionuclides that are embedded in the sediment. Um, same thing with fish, whether they're larval fish or larger fish. And once again, it can be bioaccumulated. And so these are the concerns that things will then end up getting into people. Um, I visited the Fukushima site. On the upper left-hand panel, you can see these bags of um, radioactive soil that were cleaned up and they're just sitting there that really need to be um, stabilized under things like a concrete bunker. Um, they have an underground ice barrier that's supposed to reduce the amount of groundwater going into the three reactors that are in meltdown. Um, it's not completely effective, so there's water being discharged in the ocean every day that's passing beyond this barrier, but that should be replaced with concrete. And the whole reason why um, they have this barrier and the whole reason why uh, this incident occurred was TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, never built the seawall to the height that they were told that they needed to plan for. And that was 15 meters or 45 feet. The topography off of Fukushima, their own scientists told them, the International Atomic Energy told the Tokyo Electric Power Company four years before the incident in 2007, that they did not have the proper protective barrier up in terms of the seawall. So having visited the site and that little bizarre thing at the bottom with the uh, smiling pink pandas, it was just bizarre when I was there. If you've ever been to Japan, uh, when they have construction sites, they have these plastic animals that they use for holding the stanchions. So here we are walking around the Fukushima site, um, tens of meters, hundreds of meters from three nuclear reactors in meltdown, staring at these little pink pandas uh, that are the stanchions separating us from the highly radioactive areas. One of the things that we saw when we were there is this experiment off to the right, that's um, uh, Grossi, the Dr. Grossi, the executive director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, standing in front of an experiment that is so poorly designed that it will never tell people the information they need. Now, this is their tritium uptake experiment. That's fiberglass tanks. The front one has bottom fish in it. And it's a completely misdesigned experiment that's not going to show them what they're pretending it will. And here's uh, Dr. Grossi as kind of a poster prop to be able to show what he called impeccable science. If they wanted to do the experiment correctly, um, they would be putting sediment in the tanks. They would then be putting uh, worms, snails, clams, crabs in the sediment where they would pick up the radionuclides from the tritiated water, let the fish feed on those. What Dr. Grossi is holding is a bunch of aquaculture pellets that they're feeding the fish with. And this is not anywhere near what's really going on in the environment. And so what we do see is A, the need for pouring a lot of concrete on site um, and that's where we came up with our calculation. If they did that and used it on site, then they would be able to use up that water. They would keep it local. There would be no issue of dumping it in the ocean. And I have to say, I'm very disappointed in the International Atomic Energy Agency for not doing their proper due diligence on this quality of the science that's being promoted. The larger issue then is that if we take a look at what this impact can be on the Pacific Ocean, um, I do a lot of work with Pacific Island navigators they all look at the ocean as connecting rather than separating the islands. The idea there is that the ocean currents and the fish and the organisms will connect them together. On the uh, left-hand panel are two of my past graduate students. One of them is now the Minister for the Environment for the nation of Palau. In the middle are traditional navigators building a traditional sailing canoe. On the right-hand side is this beautiful uh, fishing kite used by the people of Yap. This is such a big part of their culture that the oceans connect the islands together and they have a very strong view of ocean leadership and stewardship as an intergenerational imperative. And that's why it's been a pleasure to work with the Pacific Island Forum because the island leaders recognize what's at stake here. The people of the Pacific did nothing to contribute to the incident and disaster that occurred, but they have a lot to lose if things go bad. So in the science to policy piece, which is where we're operating, policy simply does not keep up with scientific advancements. Um, we have new discoveries on a weekly, monthly basis. And many of the existing uh, criteria and the existing threshold levels that were established have been proven not to be effective in protecting animal life and human life. This plan to do the release violates what's called a precautionary principle. 
Um, we often say an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, meaning if you don't have data to show something is dangerous, it doesn't default to it being safe. It simply means you lack data. But there's also a number of what are called GSG documents that are made by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, they're called general safety guidance. One of them, number eight, deals with transboundary, which is being largely ignored. ALARA principle means as low as reasonably achievable. And that means that no one should be exposed to ionizing radiation if there's not a direct benefit. If someone has thyroid cancer and they're getting radiation therapy for the tumor, there's a benefit to them. For the people of the Pacific and the world that are now being exposed to the radionuclides, there is no benefit to them whatsoever. Hence, it's a violation of the IAEA documents themselves. There's the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea. There are two other conventions, uh, a London Convention and Protocol, which deal with the dumping of radionuclides and waste. Uh, there's a newly passed High Seas Treaty that deals with biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions. This is, clearly falls into it. And the Pacific Island Forum developed this really elegant uh, 2050 Blue Continent Strategy that discusses how they want to protect the integrity of the ocean as a legacy for generations to come. Uh, this is now we're in the middle of what's called the United Nation Ocean Decade, uh, trying to find the science we need for the ocean we want. And what Japan is doing right now is basically a violation, if not directly to all the laws and conventions, to the spirit of ocean protection as a legacy for the future. So the policy options I'll end with are um, continuing to acquiesce to the government of Japan and any other nation that wants to continue using the ocean as a dumping ground um, if nobody takes a stand on what's going on today. Uh, there is a scale from one to seven for how bad nuclear disasters are. There have been only two number sevens. Chernobyl was the first, um, Fukushima was the second. And so for people to say this will have a negligible effect um, Chernobyl was mostly terrestrial and atmospheric. Fukushima is primarily marine, hence my role as a marine biologist. Um, but the inability or the unwillingness of the nuclear power industry, the IAEA and the Japanese government to work together to find a better way forward to me is a lost opportunity. And that's really where I'd like to end by simply saying it's a tragedy that occurred and our hearts go out to the people of Japan. Uh, during the tsunami, many lives were lost and there was a great deal of devastation. Unfortunately, it occurred, it could have been prevented in terms of the damage to uh, the nuclear power plant at Fukushima. And so now there is the opportunity to be able to use this as a way of developing the tools and technologies to improve the way all incidents going forward uh, occur. This is not the first nuclear disaster, nor will it be the last. Um, the next speaker will talk about one in your backyard. Uh, but the idea here is the monitoring program they developed doesn't protect the ocean or the people who depend on the ocean. It simply identifies problems when they occur, meaning there's no way of putting the genie back in the bottle from the discharge. Um, sometimes people say, well, other places are releasing tritium, so why shouldn't we be able to do it? I'm a firm believer that other people's bad behavior is not an excuse for me to behave badly. But when we take a look at other industries that are putting unwanted byproducts into the ocean, um, the list is there. We're adding an additional pollutants to the ocean at a time where we should be doing just the opposite. We should be cleaning it up. It's not the individual ingredients that we're concerned about. It's the soup of all of these things operating together. And it's often been said the solution to pollution is dilution. That's clearly not the case. It really is source control. So because it's the United Nations Ocean Decade, there's a great deal of international focus on ways of cleaning up the ocean. And we know that continued use of the ocean for dumping is not sustainable. This is not the first such incident, nor will it be the last, but it is an incredible opportunity for Japan and the nuclear power industry and the International Atomic Energy Agency to work with scientists throughout the world to find new approaches to be able to handle this problem. And due to the transboundary and transgenerational nature of this problem, we really need to be able to use this as a way forward to be able to do a much better job of leaving a better world to our children than the one that we're heading for there today. So I'll stop there and thank you for the opportunity and turn it over to the next speaker. All right, great. Thank you so much, Bob, for your informative and insightful presentation. You shared in-depth knowledge with scientific expertise. Yeah, so uh, I know you have a lot of questions, so we'll have the Q&A session later. So if we have any questions, please write them down in the chat. 
Now let's hear from Diane. Thank you, Robert. Um, that was an excellent presentation and it, it really does segue into what's happening in our own backyard. Um, so I'm Diane Turco, I'm director of uh, Cape Down Winders. And when this whole issue of Holtec planning to dump radioactive water into Cape Cod Bay, um, we formed a coalition uh, and we are Save Our Bay MA. So thank you for having me here to speak. Um, next. And we are a coalition of activists, real estate people, fishermen, uh, indigenous tribes, um, and uh, political people. And so we have a really great coalition of folks working to, uh, to halt dumping in the Bay. Next. Our three kind of goals are for responsible stewardship, just like Robert said, Bob said, is um, this is our bay, this is our land, and we need to protect it from the profit seekers. We do no harm, and our goal is to halt Holtex plans to release radioactive materials into our environment. Next. So I'll just kind of give you a quick, what's happening today? Well, where did we start? Um, in 2019, Holtec bought Pilgrim for $1,000. And in that transaction, they got the buildings, they got the nuclear waste, and they got the decommissioning trust fund, which is $1.2 billion. And those monies came from ratepayers who paid a, um, a tax on their bills. When Holtec's done, they may be making up to a bi billion dollars in profit. Um, so they're planning a cheap and fast decommissioning to maximize that profit. Um, but luckily we have a settlement agreement. When they bought the reactor, they made an agreement with the Massachusetts Attorney General's office that they would abide by state laws and that there would be no federal, federal preemption to any challenges. Next. So when we heard they were going to dump in the Bay, uh, they informed um, Representative Keating in the fall of 2021. And he let it out that that was their plan. Well, the community mobilized immediately and we had demonstrations. We wrote to our elected officials. We had meetings. We had a program with Dr. Barry Potvin who was with the Plymouth Board of Health. We talked about tritiated water and how it goes into, it becomes bioaccumulated and gets into our food and onto the land. Next. And we invited uh, Dr. Irina Rapino, who is a physical oceanographer at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute right here on Cape Cod. And she had done a study of how the currents would take the con contaminated plume. And she found that the water would go into Cape Cod Bay, it would come south and wrap around the Cape and swirl around and swirl around and land in the sediment. And that was very alarming. Some of it would also go along and hug the whole outer Cape and contaminate all the beaches. Next. So the headlines, you know, shape of the bay means poison would linger. A new study concludes Pilgrim Plume would hit the Outer Cape. People were alarmed. They were educated. I have to say, Christine Legere wrote some excellent articles on all of these, um, the situation. Next. So we're looking at community damage, environmental harm, hurting our blue economy because, you know, we are very um, dependent upon tourism, real estate, the fishing industry. It's all down here. And people are looking at the damage that would happen. Um, so the NRC said Holtec can release the water without net telling us. They can tell us what's in the water next year. NRC also said the Nuclear Reg Regulatory Commission, which is the uh, federal regulator, they said they could dump it in the bay. They could evaporate this contaminated water. They could truck it to an off-site licensed facility, or they could store it on site. And Holtec chose to dump it. It's the cheapest, quickest way to, to get rid of that water. Um, however, the um, community rose up, our elected officials rose up, and it was a very powerful um, action. 
where we said no dumping. Uh, next. So what we found out was that it was illegal for Holtec to dump the water. Um, the Clean Water Act prohibited the discharge of chemical pollutants, but also the Mel uh, Massachusetts Ocean Sanctuary Act pro prohibited the dumping of, or discharge of commercial, municipal, domestic, or industrial waste into a protected ocean sanctuary, which is Cape Cod Bay. But Holtec still insisted that they could dump, they could dump it. Um, and But we have a settlement agreement that tells them they need to be uh, following state law. Next. So we went to all the towns, 24 towns voted at their municipal elections to prohibit Holtec from dumping. So clearly the whole community was in support of no dumping. Next. So in 2022, that May, Senator Markey held a special hearing in Plymouth and um, Chris Singh, the CEO of Holtec spoke um, and he was he was denying that they could um, that they didn't have to uh, get permission to dump. And so I just you just have to hear what he says, because Holtec does, uses a lot of double speak and we don't trust them at all. Um, so here's um, Representative Keating. I think, Cole, if you click again, it should come on. Can you hear that? No, no, no. Sounds not coming out. Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear anything. I can't hear it. It stopped now. Okay. Well, it goes on. Chris Singh, the CEO, said they would not d discharge contaminated water into the bay. However, by definition, the water is not contaminated. So there's whole text double speak. We didn't trust them. So they, so next slide. Sorry that you didn't get to see him. It's a pretty interesting comment out of his mouth. So the next slide shows the list of back and forth letters. Oop. Uh, we got a problem. Hold on. I got to restart. PowerPoint uh, went south. All right. I'll, I'll, continue about what so this next slide is going to talk show you how the EPA said you cannot discharge it's in violation of the permit and that was in February Holtec said yes we can we can discharge letters went back and forth and back and forth all year and Holtec refused to comply with the EPA so finally in December of 2022 the EPA sent a letter threatening jail time for Holtec you get it? Oh, okay. For whole tech officials. So that would be slide. Sure. We're not dumping any water. Radioactive hmm. water. And I want to thank Mr. Singh for his commitment to doing that. So I think I will. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, Mr. Singh, I'll give you one. I'll give you one final concluding statement if you'd like to make it. Please. I truly appreciate it. But I'm not used to verbal acrobatics. Excuse me? Uh, I said I'm not used to verbal acrobatics. I said we will not dump fuel, uh, contaminated water anywhere. I also said that the water is not contaminated by its definition. Sure. We're not dumping. Okay, so it should go to the next slide. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, to that's it. Bypass yeah. the video. Let's see. Maybe I start. Okay, you go back it. right here. Yep, that's it. So there um, is the seat. Ooh. How do I start from here? From current slide. Let's try. How's that? Okay, that's it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, anyways, these are the letters back and forth with Holtec and EP, in EPA. Holtec saying it's within the language to the NIPTES permit the national pollutant. Discharge Elimination System Permit. EPA says, you're not authorized. Holtec said, we are. So um, in December 19th, they would, I mean, sorry, December 5th, EPA said, there'll be jail time for your executives if you dump. So Holtec said, okay, we'll apply for the permit. Next slide. So here's so this is in November. This is after EPA said no, you can't dump. This is this is the Holtec 
compliance officer, David Noyes, and listen to what he says. He, Andrew Gottlieb's a panel of the Nuclear uh, Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel that meets every other month to address issues of the decommissioning, and it has state officials, it has Holtec, and it has citizens. Um, it's really become the Holtec show. But listen to Andrew Gottlieb from the Association to Preserve Cape Cod ask David Noyes, will there be no discharge prior to resolution of the permit issue? Is that another video? Yep. Okay. Yep, that should. And there will be no discharge prior to the resolution of the permit issue. Um, I, I can't say that. So here it is. Holtec even says, we can't say that. They would not commit to not dumping. So that brings us to today. Next slide. And there will be. Okay, so the hubris of Holtec has been revealed in their business plan. They are still planning to dump. They have not taken that off their table as of today. And uh, Chris Singh even said, the water's so clean you could drink it. Next slide. So in January, um, in, uh, Governor Maura Healy has been great. She's been supportive, no dumping. Um, the DEP, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, on July 24th, issued a tentative determination to deny Holtex permit. And over a thousand people wrote in for the public comment, and I think only four were in support of the dumping. Um, so, but we are waiting for that final decision. It still hasn't come out yet. And so we're hoping that um, the, the next NDCAP meeting that's coming up next week, that the DEP will announce that there will be no uh, permit allowing the discharge. But Holtec is continuing to pursue dumping through the EPA. Next slide. So what we're looking at is our state laws. The state laws say you can't discharge into a protected ocean sanctuary. Also, our state, uh, our settlement agreement must be enforced. And then checking permitting process, the NIPTES permit can be um, issued by the DEP, but it also can be issued by the EPA. So we're not sure. We assume if the state denies Holtec the permit that they'll go, they'll wait till the EPA. If the EPA issues the permit, um, we're not sure what's going to happen after that. And it probably will end up in court, but Holtec still is determined to dump. Recently, a um, whistleblower letter came out and talked about how Holtec has um, put water heaters in the building uh, evaporating the water effectively, and um, that it, that has not been investigated. The NRC said it's fine. Holtec said it's fine that we're not evaporating water. We're heating the air for our worker comfort, which we know is a, is not the case. Um, and so we're waiting to we're asking for a independent investigation to look into that uh, issue. Um, and also at the last NDCAP meeting. Holtec announced they had they originally had 1.1 million gallons of water in April, and by September they had lost 200,000 gallons of water. And we want to know where that water went. Next slide. So the next NDCAP meeting is uh, next uh, next Monday. Next Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving. And what we're finding out is that when people show up everybody's really listening. The community is really on board, but once they had the uh, DEP announcement of the tentative determination, uh, attendance kind of dropped a bit. So we're hoping that we can get a crowd of people to say not one drop of water in the bay and not one molecule in the air. Holtec downplays the whole tritium issue. Um, and they brought in a, a, well, that's another story, but they do downplay the tritium issue and really deny the uh, the impact of the health um, of the people of the area. And next slide. And I'll just finish with this. There's another issue too that people need to be looking at, and that is the stored spent fuel at the site. This is new science that they just put up on the gate. And if you look at this the this um, wall here, the, ca the casks are right behind that sign. You could drive up there and throw a rock at the casks. And these are the thin walled casks made by Holtec that each contains more than half the cesium released at Chernobyl, and they're just sitting ducks. And nuclear, it's a pre-deployed nuclear weapon, and nobody's paying attention to that. So that's an, the next issue that needs to be uh, addressed at Pilgrim. But thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you so much, Diane, for your insightful presentation. Uh, yeah, your presentation 
delve deeply into our region's nuclear wastewater issue, explaining the legislative efforts to combat coal tax illegal discharge. So I noticed uh, some- Can I even, sorry to interrupt, but can I yes. really quick speak? Yes. Make, uh, it, make a little speech? Yeah, regarding the regional uh, re nuclear wastewater issue, well, I was gonna say I was gonna say can I have a can I have a little speech. Can I have a little speech? Speech. speech okay. So in, okay. In in relation to. Get this. Okay, whole tag issue, the regional yeah. issue. Okay, go yeah. ahead. Alrighty. This is why. All this that you said, said Robert and Deanna, this is why I cre I'm trying to create a special day for the UN called International, a UN Observance Day called International Radiation Awareness Day, which is supposed to raise awareness about what you guys, what you guys have, uh, what you guys spoke about, spoke about and how da dangerous radiation could do to the, bo the body. Mm -hmm. I just wish, I just, like, especially, like, especially at the Runa Dome, Runa Dome where it's sink sink even more and release more radio radiation to that you should see how many signatures i got got for that petition to get for the u.s government to clean up that please <laughs> Twenty thousand. and any anyway you got you should try and focus on diablo diablo canyon Diablo canyon because that if that plant if that plant goes off we can california could experience its own fukushima mm -hmm. maybe worse right I've learned that a lot. At least one of the one of the two was shut down, but we need to still shut down Fukushima. Fukushima. I mean, not Fukushima. Diablo Canyon. Diablo Canyon. That might that was my that was my bad, bad about saying that. Saying that. <laughs> Sorry, I got high function autism, so I got just um. Bear with me. Bear with. I even. Okay, I'm try, so trying everything to help out uh, help out in this kind of a situa situation. That that's. What, but do you think do you think I can have your support for support for the idea idea of a UN Observance Day day for International Radiation Awareness Day? Because well, what um, that entail? What kind of support are you asking for? To get to have it created, I haven't decided what day it should be on, but I think maybe it should be on the be based be on the good day the of the guy. Of that one Japanese person who had received the most lethal dose of radiation and died a horrible death, based based off him, in mem kind of in memory of him, if you know, if we remember him, mem remember. Uh, I don't I don't know his name off the top of my head, head, but I know it was a radiation incident in Japan, Japan that's related to that. The most radioactive man in 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 the world. He got the highest ser service. Do you want me to look him up real quick, or do you think I, or do you think that's it? Um, I, I think you need to put your presentation uh, with the details in more clearly and touch base with Cole or somebody else. Yeah, so you need to, okay, so uh, Jeffrey, you need to contact us regarding your um, concerns and you can, yeah, we can we can discuss later. So we would like to address uh, questions regarding today's presentations. OK, so yeah. I, oh, wait, I remember that. Okay. Sorry, I remember can the you name contact now. us via email. OK, we can discuss your concerns later, please. OK, so we I noticed some questions in the chat. So. Um, Okay, so this is a question from, okay, so, well, let me see, okay. I'm trying to find questions. Okay. I have a question. Okay. So yeah. Um Eileen, okay, please go ahead. 
I was fascinated with um, Richard's comment about the radi act radioactive water being put into cement, which is a, a big user of, of cement and a lot of energy. I'm, I'd like to, exp if you can, expand on how you picture the cement would be uh, made and what would happen with the cement blocks. Uh, sure. So we actually have a paper we wrote on it. Um, what I can do is maybe send it to uh, Kim Ju about uh, so she can distribute it to others. But again, it's one thing to say no. It's another thing to say, we, you know, the reality of we have it, what do we do with it? So we began to look at it. And it was really striking when we were at the site of how much concrete they really have to pour in that site for things to go forward. They need to extend the seawall to the height that it should have been in the first place of 15 meters. They need to replace the underground ice barrier with concrete. And you saw those bags of radioactive soil that are just sitting there. The next typhoon that comes, it's all going into the ocean. So we had this discussion with TEPCO and with the Japanese government during our meeting saying when we did the calculation, um, especially for things like tritium, tritium is a low level beta emitter as are a number of the radionuclides there which means that their penetrating ability is less than five tenths of a micron in concrete. So it's not going anywhere. The half-life of um, tritium being 12.3 years, uh, the functional half-life of concrete is 50 years. So then 50 years, you're down 6% of your original ionized radiation because you've gone through four half-lives. So you go from 100% to 50, uh, to 25, to 12.5, to six. And it's on site, so it's not getting into the ocean. And so we actually raised that during one of our discussions. It's interesting, when we're meeting in Japan, we're meeting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry and TEPCO. And so my first question as an environmental scientist and a biologist is, where are your fisher agencies, uh, fisheries agencies, where's your environmental protection agency, and where's your human health agency, like our version of the National Institutes of Health? They're nowhere to be found. So this is all driven by industry and international affairs and the um, owner of the plant. And so he said, we've done a calculation. And if you were to put it into concrete, um, you're absolutely correct. It takes a lot of water to build concrete. And so the site's already contaminated. No one's gonna be doing any farming there. No one's gonna be able to live there. And it was very telling that on one hand, they're saying the water's totally safe. On the other hand, they don't want any of it to remain anywhere near their coast or their site. And so they started coming up with these excuses saying, well, we've done that and we've looked into it and it's not viable. And then they started coming up with excuses, one of which just floored me, saying, well, um, some of the water in some of the tanks, there's over a thousand tanks. Um, their sampling design is really terrible. They don't even know what's in the tanks. There are 62 radionuclides of interest, tritium only being one and probably not the one of greatest concern. When we started paying them down, they said, well, some of the water in the tanks is salt water. And if you mix salt water with concrete, then it's not stable. And so what they call their advanced liquid processing system, the core of it is reverse osmosis. And then they have these matrices that are supposed to absorb the others. So my question is, wait a second, there's salt in the water and you're saying that your reverse osmosis system isn't pulling out the salt. How in the world is it supposed to pull out any radionuclides? Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, it was something else. Every time we pinned them down on something really ridiculous, they said, they take 180 degrees, kind of like your, your colleagues in uh, Massachusetts. You pin them down on a fact, and then they find every excuse not to do it. That's what happened with the concrete option. We said, here is what we're proposing, not what you guys are saying at all. But if you were to mix it, half of it, a quarter of it, here is the calculation. You would burn it up in five years versus 30 years. And I don't know about you guys, but when, you know, IAEA says if everything goes to plan, you know, I work in a laboratory, I'm a scientist, I oversee graduate students, technicians, I can't make it a week without having some major screw up in our laboratory. How in the world can this group who the whole reason this disaster occurred was because of their in unwillingness to stand mm -hmm. to accepted um, protective measures that were established. And so there's no way in the world that I can see they're going to be able to stay to plan but the concrete option at least takes away many of the greatest concerns of biological availability, of the half-lives, of intergenerational and transboundary issues, and they refuse to consider that at all. We even brought an option to the Pacific Island Forum. Why don't you negotiate with them and say, we'll, we'll consider your release if you use the first 50% of the water on site, 
And that again begs the question, if the water is so safe and they make statements like, well, you can drink it. No, you can't, or you can, but it would not be a really good idea. Um, but even that it's, it's missing the point. These kinds of um, problems biologically don't show up for years and in some cases decades, but it's not a matter of if they will occur, it's a matter of when they will occur. And so this concrete option, and I'll send the paper, um, it's not that long, but uh, we had an engineer look at it. We did the calculations and we continue to push it, including the IAEA. And when we held them to bear and said, look, why doesn't the International Atomic Energy Agency say, why don't we try a portion of the water into concrete and see what happens? Then the response was, we don't give alternatives. And everything I heard from the International Atomic Energy Agency, if there are any lawyers in the groups called plausible deniability, every state they said was plausible deniability for if and when the problems occur, they will then claim, well, we had nothing to do with it. It was a Japanese decision. And that to me is very disturbing as a scientist and as a person. Right. Thank you. Wow, I learned a lot. Wow, it's really incredible. Mm -hmm. So I noticed a hand, a uh, raised hand. So uh, Thomas, please go ahead with your question. Okay, please unmute yourself. Okay, please unmute yourself, Thomas. We can oh, I'm sorry, this is a great presentation and this is for Robert. So thank you for doing this. Um, I'm, I'd like to get a sense of uh, how much um, consensus there is in the international scientific community, specifically the environmentally aware scientific community, and what mechanisms they have for pushing back, number one. And number two, could you speak briefly about, uh, we know that uh, uh, South Korea and China are very concerned about this in terms of their food supply. Could you address that briefly? Sure. Thank, you. Thank you much for the questions. And, you know, I'm a scientist by training, but I'm also a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a person. So, you know, I try to separate out the two. As a scientist, I look at the data and they're very compelling to say that this is just the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. And once again, you know, as a scientist, I'm just saying, show me the data that it's safe yeah. and then I'll buy it. I'll, I'll right. be the first one to endorse it. And to this day, they haven't been able to produce it. Um, the, uh, quite the opposite, when we examine the data, it's very compelling to say this should never be allowed to go forward. In a real world, I would love to think that the science is going to influence the policy, but the reality is this decision was made long before we looked at the first data set. The pipe was built before they received any approval. It was already determined by the Japanese government that this is the way they were going to go forward. So I would like to think that our science has value and I would like to think maybe there's still hope. And that's why we keep doing it. Every time I get a request between myself and my colleagues, I know I must have done 100 interviews within the last two months, and I'll do another 100 next month if it'll help. The real reality is uh, political will and mm -hmm. the voice of the community. Right. Um, right. It's Japan is basically even the fishers there. Um, I have colleagues in Japan who are wonderful scientists, and I talk with several of them saying, why aren't you guys standing up against it? And because you're being censored. Um, they have a really very good, excellent uh, marine uh, research agency called JAMSTEC. And I know a number of scientists, I've worked with them before. The scientific community is you know, relatively small and you know, very intimate. We know each other. And they said three of their members quit because they had a paper accepted for publication on Fukushima. And these three really top-notch scientists were told they had to withdraw the paper. So it was outright censorship of their own science. And then I have other Japanese scientists, colleagues of mine who are friends, who heard some of my um, uh, interviews in the science paper that I put the link there, they read the article in science and they said, we don't hear any of this in Japan. Can you help us understand what's going on? So I'm having to give data to my colleagues, my Japanese scientific colleagues there, wow. so they know what's going on. Uh, there was a law passed by the Japanese government that basically said scientists or journalists that are challenging the security of Japan can be held legally uh, responsible for it, meaning with censorship. Um, Japan has some of the best scientists in the world. So it's not a matter of them not having the science. It's a matter of the government squashing it. Um, where we go from there, again, I'm not a policymaker, I'm a scientist. So when we work with the Pacific Island Forum, you know, our job is A, to review the science and to explain it to them in a form and a format they can understand. And they're very sharp people. They're lawyers, they're policymakers, they're not scientists. So one would not expect them to know. And so we've taken, you know, very uh, careful approach to being able to 
explain things. There's nothing that can't be explained clearly if you want to, and that's what we tried to do. It's up to them politically to decide what they're willing to do and go forward. And I pointed out to them, they do have options. They say, well, Japan is an independent nation. They can do whatever they want to. And I said, all right, I'm a scientist, but I can tell you the truth. If you were to say, okay, if you dump that water in the ocean, we're closing our EEZ to your fisheries and to your ability to go through our nations, mm -hmm. tomorrow it's going to be turned off. Um, there's a lot of money going on behind the scenes. You know, I'm not telling people things they don't know. Deals are being made unilateral. We'll build this road and we'll give you this thing here. And I'm not judging any of the nations. I'm simply saying, based on the science, this is not acceptable going forward. And once again, I think the part that's most heart wrenching to me, having lived on a radioactive atoll for two years and worked with the community, it's not just chemistry and it's not just biology. It's human rights. It's all of these things about right. colonization and disrespect for boundaries and legacy we leave for the future. You know, I'm a parent. I can't help but look at that lens as well. The science says no. The physicists and the chemists are saying, well, if you look at the uh, volume of the ocean and you look at the concentration of radionuclides, it's below those levels. But that's the point. Once you put biology in, you get the uptake, you get the trophic transfer, you get the bioaccumulation, all of those calculations go down the tube. And now this is what we're looking at here. And we know it. When I did the studies and my colleagues from Lawrence Livermore and from Brookhaven National Laboratory, the data are clear. The tritium story is still a little bit out, but a couple of reviews that just came out this year show that tritium is more of a concern than people have really examined. And that gets back to that, what we call relative biological effectiveness. <laughs> the example one of them used, getting hit with a gamma ray is like getting a through and through bullet wound. You know, as long as you don't hit anything valuable and it goes right through, you plug the two holes and you're good to go. Um, the beta emitters are more like getting hit with a dum-dum bullet or a slug, and it sits there. And the problem is radionuclides like strontium-90. Um, the nickname is the bone seeker, because strontium-90 will, in fact, um, get incorporated into bone. And your bone marrow is where your white blood cells and red blood cells are constantly turning over and being formed. It's the last place you want uh, radiation, because it's going to be irradiating cells that are in division, and that's where you get things like cancers. Trying to do the epidemiology of cancer is nearly impossible because there's so many different causes for it. But there's one thing that is universal. Increased exposure ionizing radiation increases the exposure and chances of cancers. And how do you play the game when you can say 3%, 5%, you know, whatever you look at. The reality is if you go into a classroom of 100 children, a 3% means pick the three kids that you want to see get cancer and potentially die from it. And so, you know, it's trying to put reality to the numbers the science is there. Um, I continue to push with all my colleagues. Um, but what I get back from the U.S. State Department as well, um, it's Pacific Security, a.k.a. China, which is kind of ironic because China is the one nation that's really supporting the Pacific Islands and protecting the integrity of the ocean for future generations. They've cut fisheries exports from Japan by 75 percent. And now the Japanese fisheries are pushing back the Japanese government. And it's going to be politics in the end. So the best we can do is give honest science to give science in the most clear form we can with the hope that if we do provide it in a way, in a form that people can use, they can make the right policies. Unfortunately, we don't see that yet, but with 30 years to go, you know, every day is another opportunity to, to shut off the valve and to stop putting uh, the treated contaminated water into the ocean. It's gonna take a while for anything to show up. So it's not as if, you know, the world is gonna end today or tomorrow or even next year. But we do have a chance to stop this, to re, re, um, basically change the trajectory, the way in which we go forward. And I'm just amazed at the industry not having the sense to realize that their credibility is on the line, along with the Japanese government and the International Atomic Energy Agency, because they're not using the best available science. And that is something I can say for sure. All right. Thank you. So we are running a bit over time. So I'd like to express gratitude to Cole and others for their patience. So uh, due to time constraints, I'd like to give the opportunity to speak up uh, to one of our speakers today, Diane, uh, Diane, can you go ahead? Well, I just wanted to let folks know too, is that following what you're saying, Robert, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not recognize the um, National Academy of Sciences Beer 7 report, which said there's no safe dose of radiation. At the last NDCAP meeting, I asked the NRC if there was any safe level of radiation exposure for children, and they said yes. And so that's the agency that is over overseeing what's happening at Pilgrim. And so, Robert, it's happening in our backyard, too. Thank you. 
Okay, Beth, now you can share your thoughts. Okay, unmute yourself first. Please unmute yourself, Beth. I, I think I had to do it for her. I've done that now. Oh. Or I've asked her to unmute. Too. I, yeah, it wouldn't let me initially, but I, I, I think I'm unmuted now. I just have a quick question. I'm really concerned about how the uh, dumping of um, radioactive water is going to affect uh, the fish and um, the um, the uh, coastline of the United States. Uh, my question is, what is the? How are we going to get rid of all these radioactive uh, 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 waters and stuff? What What is the way we're going to deal with this? That's that's my real concern. Did I ask that right? Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. Oh, so, was the alternative, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So the alternative I mentioned, and I'll go ahead and send that paper uh, to um, Kuiju about uh, the concrete option. That's something we think yeah. would work, and there's a number of views that um, it's it's something that could do a lot better. The biggest concern we have, at least I have as a biologist, is the biological uptake, and that gets to your issue. What about the fish? What about what's getting there? Um, it's in low quantities, of that there's no kind of question. And so the idea that it's going to be diluted down, again, is the conflict between biology and chemistry. We know that it gets biologically taken up. Japan did what's called a radiological environmental impact assessment. And in that, they do a bunch of modeling. And their modeling assumptions are false. They say, well, it'll reach equilibrium with the sediment. The sediment is a pool for radionuclides, and a lot of them will get bound. There are 62 radionuclides. They don't even know what's in the tanks that they're discharging from. Um, of the 62, they've only really gone into any detail on about 20 of them. And of the 1,000 uh, tanks, they've only done about a third. And so one of our first questions is, if you don't even know what's there, how do you know about the effectiveness of your treatment and removing it? Right. And on the biological part, you know, they're saying, well, we're not really concerned with what's in the tanks. We're worried about what's getting out. In a way, I can kind of somewhat understand what they're saying, but in the end, no, because how do you do a QAQC? How do you know if you're going to have to troubleshoot what's going wrong if you don't know what's there in the first place. They're saying, well, even if we have to pass it through the advanced liquid processing system, the ALPS, and they chose that because they wanted it to have an acronym that made people think of a clean environment, you think of the ALPS. So again, every step of the way, there's been nothing but marketing here. Um, but they said, even after we run it through 300 times, we'll do it. But I'm saying, but doesn't that tell you something? If it's going through and we've seen the data and it's very erratic saying, why is it so inconsistent? Why are the ratios between strontium and cesium so off when they should be close together and they're off by a factor of 8,000? One of the fish caught off of Fukushima right in the little area right there had 180 times the value of what's considered to be safe. And they're saying, well, there shouldn't be any fish in there. We have exclusion. Well, tell it to the fish that he's not supposed to be there. Um, the fish get in there in the biological life as well. Will it get across the Pacific? Yeah. Will it be in levels that are of concern? Uh, the tuna that was caught in 2011 was very, very low levels, but that was the same year that the uh, incident occurred. And after 20 years, that we don't know. And then that's why we ask them, set up a decent experiment that will answer the question. And of course, they made an experiment that would show nothing. Um, I could do that same experiment with a kitchen sponge. You put it in the water, it equilibrates with whatever's around it. You take it out and put it in a clean tank and it depurates. I said, fine, but if you wanna do it right, do it this way. On three different occasions, we told them how to set up the experiment correctly to answer your question about biological uptake. There are really good data to show tritium uptake and being organically bound. And when we push them on that, um, then we get things where you can drink tritiated water and it goes through your body in 10 days. That's correct. But we're not talking about drinking tritiated water. We're talking about eating organisms that have organically bound tritium that can be stored for 550 days in the liver. And it really depends. It goes into different things. I mean, a science paper that I sent the link, we address. It's partitioned differently with even in the same organism. What goes into the bone, what goes into the liver, what goes into the fat. And you need to take that into account. If you take the whole fish and grind it up, and then you look at what the value is across an entire fish, that's not the most important thing to know. What's in the muscle, what's in the tissue, what's in the liver. And I know this from in a wee talk because people love to eat fish stomachs of the fish that they catch. That was the hot one because when fish eat, the radionuclides are found in the stomach. They don't eat the muscle right away. They eat the stomach right away. And I'm trying to tell the Marshallese, don't do that because that's an area in which you're going to get more radionuclides. So 
you know, we still need more data, you know, typical scientists, but the reality is the precautionary principle says no way. In the absence of data showing something is safe, it's not until proven so, and that's where we're trying to push them. But the data we do have, the new data, and especially on these, what we call stochastic, the DNA damage, the RNA damage, the signaling protein damage that are so critical. We have good techniques. We do it in our lab all the time. DNA AP, we use uh, a, a variety of molecular biomarkers. Interestingly enough, Chernobyl data are coming back. When they compare the numbers they get in a laboratory experiment on an animal, whether it's a fish or a boar, um, what they see in the field is eight times worse than what they see in the laboratory because these animals are not living in a vacuum. They're not living in a laboratory chamber. They're out there with a variety of other environmental stressors, which is why I pointed to the problems we already have in the ocean. So we can't say that we're painting on this blank canvas. We've got an ocean that's already impaired, and everybody knows that. Fishers know that. All of the islanders know that. Why are we continuing to use the ocean as a dumping ground for stuff that we know we shouldn't be doing it? And this is the ultimate opportunity to turn it around. The Japanese government could be the world leader in being able to show how to do it and do it right. IAEA could get credibility by demonstrating it's not just non-proliferation. I give them full credit for that. But they should not be supporting proliferation of nuclear power plants if they're going to continue to use our ocean and the environment as the dumping ground for every mistake that they make when they cut corners like we see them doing. Okay, so great. Thank you so much for your great answers. So uh, I know we are running over time. However, I'd like to invite uh, Nan Kim to ask a question. So it's Nan, Nan Kim is here. Yes. Yes, okay, go ahead. Great, thank you so much for this webinar. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a question to um, Bob Richmond, uh, since we had spoken earlier, and I wanted to, uh, just the general understanding is that the uh, release or the dumping has already started, so it can induce a little cynicism or maybe some um, apathy that it's already too late. And if you could just speak to the fact, as we mentioned earlier, that actually these early tranches, there's been three since they started in August, late August, and the later um, releases are either in that uh, group that where there's an unknown or there's likely to be higher amounts. So I think that it's kind of crucial for this group to know that it's a matter of like, it's not too late. We have to also get that word out that even though it started and that has brought it sort of brought home that this is actually happening, but it can be reversed. And that um, the key is, the point is that you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but actually the later ones are where we're particularly concerned with and we have to stop it right away. So Bob, could you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, amen. What do you say? <laughs> I mean, definitely. <laughs> you know, we're 30 years to go. We're in, you know, uh, 29 years and uh, nine months. So they released about 20 tons of treated contaminated water. Of course, they've chosen the tanks that they know there's probably nothing in them right now. You know, we have ridiculous things like our ambassador to Japan eating sushi pur purportedly from Fukushima. I mean, that's embarrassing. You know, I actually talked to some people I know in the State Department said, don't even do things like that. You're just making the United States a caricature of your responsibility when you do that. Every scientist in the world knows it's BS and so do you. And so the, uh, you know, I'm not to signal out the United States, the Australian ambassador did the same. The people doing the PR for these people are just, you know, I have to just shake my head and say, come on, don't even go there. So yes, absolutely. They could stop it tomorrow. They could stop it anytime they want to. And I think your point is exactly the message that needs to go across. What's been released so far is negligible. And I know that they're cherry picking the tanks, or I'm guessing they're cherry picking the tanks. And of course, they're saying, well, we didn't pick up anything with fish. Well, of course not. You know, it's going to take some time. But these are the concerns. I think what they're waiting to do is just see. Let's go ahead and give it a try and see what the reaction is. I think the more uh, reaction there is against it, the greater the chance there is of stopping it. And right now I know in tracking people I know in Japan that the fishing community is really upset. And the reality is, it's that financially, 75% um, of their market has disappeared within the last two months and they're feeling it. So the Japanese government is freezing fish. Who are they gonna feed it to, to the Japanese people? And I think it's finally gonna come back, but the more people will push the United States to be able to take a stand and show responsibility and to reach out internationally. I still look at the Pacific Island Forum of those 18 island nations. I said, you know, you have a lot more clout than you think you do. And if you do pull together, 
Um, you could stop them tomorrow, but that's your decision and not mine. Okay. Um, unfortunately, due to time constraints, uh, we won't be able to address all of your questions today. So I appreciate your understanding. Once again, a big thank you to both Bob and Diane for being with us tonight. Um, I have gained valuable insights. The ocean already stressed by pollution, climate change, overfishing, and marine resource exploitation and adding uh, radioactive water aggravates the situation. And our oceans are all interconnected and ultimately the entire world shares the same water. Discharging nuclear waste water into the sea is serious problem for all of us, undermining the, the ecosystem and our health. So our goal is to raise awareness about the risks of Japan's nuclear waste water dumping and make sure the public is well informed. So uh, to achieve this, we organized a monthly protest in Harbor Square. Our next protest is to scheduled for December 16th at 3 p.m. So we'd like to invite you to join us in raising our voice against this issue. So Sungi already shared the information about the protest and the link to the petition. Please sign the petition and feel free to share the link. All right. So. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and later we'll send you the link to the recorded video via email and, and other information regarding Dr. Richmond's uh, research. And we'd like to express uh, our gratitude once again to Bob and Diane for uh, your insightful presentations today. And thank you so much, uh, everyone who joined us tonight.